So we're back in Ezekiel chapter 20, so if you turn with me there. And uh, do I dare ask you what I taught last week? <laughs> we covered the first 26 verses of the chapter. And what was Ezekiel dealing with? I'm sorry? The unfaithfulness of Israel, right from the very beginning when he took them out of Egypt. He was rehearsing their history. They have acted like harlots. In chapter 16, he goes to great length with all of the accusations that can be proven true against them and the way in which they were committing spiritual adultery against the Lord. He calls them harlots. And we'll see that again in, verse, in uh, chapter 23 when he speaks of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, that they were twin sisters in their harlotry, in their spiritual betrayal against the Lord. And now we see here, as we move into chapter 20, what year is it? <clears throat> Thank you, 591. It's 591 B.C. It's five years before the complete destruction of the nation of Judah and the destruction of the temple in 586 B.C. And on what day was the temple destroyed? The ninth day of the Jewish month of Av, Tisha B'Av. And it's no coincidence that the first temple in 586 was destroyed on the very day. And then the second temple, we call that Herod's temple, but it's really Zerubbabel's temple that Herod built upon. But the Romans destroyed that on the very same day, obviously, um, several years later, but on Tisha B'Av. And there have been so many things that have happened to the Jewish people on Tisha B'Av. Hmm? Yeah. 1492. What happened? Columbus sailed, the ocean blew. <laughs> but on the day he said sail, Tisha B'Av, what happened in Spain? The Jewish expulsion of the Jews from Spain who wouldn't convert to Catholicism, and the many of them, thousands of them, were murdered. Do you know the Inquisition went on for a thousand years in Europe, where believers were being killed, murdered? true Christians who embraced the scriptures as well as Jews being murdered simply because of their faith, because they wouldn't convert to Catholicism. No. What a stain upon the church, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, for the longest time, if you went to Israel and you told a Jew that you were a Christian, they immediately thought you were Catholic. And there was a wall that went up immediately because of the way in which the Catholics had collaborated with the Nazis and then smuggled so many of these Nazis, these murderers, down into Argentina and other places throughout the world so they could escape the justice that they were due. But we see that the persecution of the Jews has been going on for a long time. And we know from the scriptures, unfortunately, the worst is yet to come. Why is that happening? Well, because of the rejection of the Messiah, as Israel, national Israel, rejected Jesus Christ and the truth that he was presenting, that he was the Pesach. What's Pesach? Passover. The Passover Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Hmm? Yeah. I pass all these church marquees and billboards, and they say they're celebrating Eshtar. I want to stop and call them up and say, it's Pesach, it's Passover, you idiot. <laughs> but I refrain myself. But nonetheless, he was rehearsing their history until they had gone into the land. Now remember, the whole previous generation had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Doubt and unbelief. They didn't believe God that he was going to make good on all of the promises he gave them relative to conquering over the land. He said, you will dwell in houses you haven't built, cities you haven't constructed. You'll enjoy vineyards you did not plant, you know, et cetera, et cetera, because they were going to dispossess the pagan peoples because of their outrageous sins and behavior. And the chief sin of the pagan peoples around Israel in the promised land was what? And, and that idolatry was manifested by what chief sin that offended God more than any other? 
Yeah, the worship of Molech, where they would sacrifice their children in the fires to Molech. That was their form of abortion. And nothing upset God more because the greatest gift that God gives a people, the greatest gift that God gives us as a family are our children. The Bible makes it clear that children are a reward from the Lord, aren't they? Precious in the sight of the Lord is every single child. Oh, but how we have followed suit, haven't we? Yeah. The murderous act of the Jews and the ancient pagan peoples in Israel in sacrificing their children to Molech. Well, you could say to some degree, to some degree, there was an ignorance there, but not today. We're without excuse. We can't say we're ignorant of these things. 50% of the children conceived now are murdered in abortion. And the 50% that make it out of the womb, the womb is meant to be the safest place for a human being for the first nine months of their existence. And today it's one of the most dangerous places. But when they make it out of the womb, then what we have done, look what we have done to our children. In the United States, teen suicide is at an epidemic. We've so confused them about who they are. I was so surprised. Richard Dawkins, you know who Richard Dawkins is? Devout atheist, evolutionist, defender of Darwinism. That's his religion. It's not a scientific fact. It's a religion. Richard Dawkins came out this week, and what did he say? There's two genders. There's only two genders. There's only two genders and only two possibilities. You're either male or you are female. And he said, that's the science. It's either XY or XX in your chromosome construction that God has designed. I was surprised that he would say that, but he can't even wake up these morons, these fools. And look what we're doing to these children, consenting to mutilating their bodies giving them pharmaceuticals which will affect them for the rest of their lives. And then the emotional and psychological damage that it does. It's just, it's, listen, that is just coming to roost now. We're just seeing the tip of the iceberg on the effect of all of this madness, this craziness. But how it must break the heart of God, who offers these children as a blessing, offers these children as a reward. Only God puts fruit in the womb. Only God can bring about. But yes, you can have a man and a woman come together in a physical union, but it's God who brings forth life. You see? What a disregard for what he's done. Well, in the first portion of chapter 20, up to verse 26, he was indicting them. He's using Ezekiel as a prosecutor. Ezekiel is indicting him and putting all of these charges against them that the Lord has given him, and, and they've been proven to be true. And now he's going to talk about the next generation, how they came into the land, the land of promise, the land that God would give them. And so miraculously had he given them the land, just, just as they were released from the bondage of Egypt, so miraculously they came into the land in a miraculous way. Not only did they cross the Red Sea on dry ground, what else happened when they went into the land? I'm sorry? Yeah, the River Jordan in the spring of the year when it's raging parted and they were able to cross. River Jordan without any problem, not any issue. Nobody got swept away. Another miraculous crossing. And going into the promised land is not a lot of hymns will equate that as to going into heaven. No, 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 no. When they went into the promised land, there were battles that they had to fight. There were seven major battles that they ended up fighting. We're living the abundant, victorious life in Christ, aren't we? Are you free from battles? No, no. There's a battle that goes on every day, isn't there? Where does that battle take place, beloved? Right here, yeah, in my life, in my heart. Just continuing to yield and surrender to my king to avoid my desires and my fleshly wants and, con and control my behavior by you know, my correct thinking and honoring God as my father. So we'll pick it up in verse 27, because in 26 he told the previous generation, fine, fine, I'm going to give you over to your Sin. You see, unlike Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, what does Gethsemane mean? 
I'll have press. I'll have press. Now, when his life was being pressed, because he knew exactly what was going to take place, he knew he was going to be going to the cross. He was going to be experiencing a suffering that, that very few have ever suffered in a physical sense, but even more so, he would experience a phys a, an emotional, relational, spiritual suffering that no man has ever experienced. And what was that? Separation from his father, when he had eternally existed from eternity past, with the Father in this wonderful union. And now, when he took upon himself the sins of the world, he was separated from his Father, never knowing that separation ever, ever. Mm. My God, my God, Psalm 22, what did he say? Why have thou forsaken me? You know, Psalm 22 is the psalm of the cross. It begins with that statement, just as Jesus said upon the cross. And how did Jesus die? What were the last words of Jesus? It is finished. And if you read Psalm 22, it's prophetic. David wrote that under the spirit of prophecy. And the very last statement there in Psalm 22 is, it can be interpreted in Hebrew, and it's done. It's finished. What was finished? What was done? His death? His suffering? The redemption that God desired. Now, God is not going to forsake Israel because God made a promise to Israel that were unilateral, not bilateral. He didn't make those promises. He didn't make those commitments based upon what they would do, that if you will, I will. No, no, no. There's some of those conditional promises, but, but the most precious promises that God made to Israel, the most precious promises that he made to you and I, they're unilateral. God says he will, he will, he will. And he keeps his promises. And he's going to keep his promise to Israel in spite of, of the despicable way in which they've acted towards him. So the second generation, verse 27, Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, In this too your fathers have blasphemed me by being unfaithful to me. When I brought them into the land concerning which I had raised my hand in an oath to give them, and they saw all the high hills and all the thick trees, there they offered their sacrifices and provoked me with their offerings. There they also set up their sweet aroma and poured out their drink offerings. In the promised land, as soon as they got into the promised land, they saw these high hills and these groves. What is he talking about here? There are places of pagan worship. Now, we don't have any children here. What, what were these places? What was their practice when they would go into these groves, into these high places of pagan worship? They would get into their pharmakia, right? Uh, in, the, in the induced states of consciousness. And then they would engage in all kinds of immoral sexual activity. And with that sexual promiscuity, what results from that? Unwanted pregnancies, right? Which, which many called in the pro-choice arena a crisis pregnancy. Is there any crisis pregnancy? Should every pregnancy not be a blessing and not a crisis? Hmm? But that's what would take place. They went up into the groves and they were imitating because they were going with the lust of the flesh rather than obeying the Lord and restraining themselves. Hmm. Many will say, you know, I was just, I was born that way. You're born a homosexual? You're born a lesbian? You're born a drug addict? You're born an adulterer? You're born a fornicator? You're born a murderer? You're born a sinner. Every one of us are born a sinner, and then we have some preferences, some, some sins that we enjoy more than others. There's some sins I can't be tempted by. Doesn't resonate with me. I could care less. But there's some sins that I have to be very careful. Take heed to yourself. How, many, how often does God say that, both in the Old Testament and the New, that we're to take heed to ourselves? You need to discern and understand yourself, and what sin would you be inclined to giving yourself over to? That's the one Satan's going to tempt you with, the world and your flesh, you see. Yeah, well, that's what took place here. And so they started right from the very beginning, as soon as they went into the promised land. Verse 29, and then I said to them, what is this high place to which you go? And so its name is called Bama, 
to this day, meaning high place, the groves. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, are you defiling yourself in the manner of your fathers and committing harlotry according to their abominations? Oh, isn't it terrible when sin just perpetuates itself? It carries on from one generation to the next. You know, God was speaking through Moses in Exodus, and he said the sins of the fathers will be passed to the children to the third, to the fourth generation. I, I'm the first generation of Ariali, born again, first. Oh, but there are generational Ariales who are drunkards, alcoholics, liars, thieves, immoral people. And we used to think it was okay that we had our neighborhood Robin Hood. You know our neighborhood Robin Hood in the Italian culture? I lived in a subculture in upstate New York. Most of the area and I lived in, they were either Polish or Italians. And who was the Robin Hood in my culture? The local godfather. His name was Legs de Coco. He was the most powerful mafioso uh, in the northeast region of New York and in the uh, east of the Rockies. I mean, uh, very, very powerful mafioso. And, you know, we uh, prided ourselves that we weren't like other Americans. We were Italian, and we were connected. You know, we used to say, you know, oh, no, no, no. Americans, they pay retail. We don't pay retail. You know what I mean by that? Right? We got hot deals, you know. We would, we would buy stolen goods that they would send. And, you know, I mean, we're not talking about petty thieves. We're talking about warehouses where you could go and shop and buy this stolen merchandise for a significant discount. And growing up in that culture, just you, you accept that. Rob from the rich and give to the poor, and who's more needy than I am? You know. <laughs> But that, that was the justification. You know? and, and, and I lived in that for a long time. I didn't, I didn't come to know the Lord for 30 years. For 30 years, the truth meant nothing to me. Nothing. You used every situation for whatever advantage you could get out of it, whatever opportunity you could exploit. The sins of the fathers being passed to the third and the fourth generation, those behaviors and and. So many of in my gamblers, oh my goodness, they gamble on everything imaginable. <laughs> but I used to go to school and make fun of the, you have a day where everybody would have to tell the class what your father did. And I tell them my father was a sports mechanic. The teacher said, what, what do you mean your father's a sports mechanic? He fixed it a baseball, he fixed it a boxing, he fixed it a football, he fixed it a horses. You know what that means? No, you, you, you're so innocent. You don't even know what that means, do you? You're so sweet. Huh? Oh, but Israel, why? Why would you carry on the abominations of your fathers that I detest? And when I came to that awareness, I mean, just, you know, to, I mean, to this day, I just have so much regret and sorrow for the way things could have been instead of what they were what they should have been instead of what they were. Amen? Mm. For when you offer your gifts, verse 31, and you make your sons pass through the fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols, even to this day. So shall I be inquired of by you? O house of Israel, as I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. You can pray all you want. You can cry. You can weep. You can mourn. But I won't hear you. Why? Because your hearts are so far from me. Mm. I think I told you last week about a young man who called me up because uh, he is being oppressed, haunted, terrorized by demons at night. He's a meth addict. And meth will do that to you. And he called me again the other night and wanted me to go in the middle of the night and come to his home down in Gray Court and... Um, pray a blessing over his home, perform an exorcist. I said, the only demon you need to get taken care of is the one that's in your heart right now. But he won't listen to me. He's always got all those justifications, you see. Do you know, there's only two forces at work that inspire every human being. It's either God or it's Satan, Hasatan. 
It's either the seed of the woman or the seed of the serpent. That's two choices, and people you'll meet. So we're either being inspired by the good or we're being inspired by evil. Now, we can sugarcoat the evil, make it look like something other than what it really is. But God knows. And you know, in our heart of hearts, we know. Hmm? Hmm. No. Here they defiled themselves with their idols and that they are causing their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire. Uh, when I first got saved back in 1980, the first book God had me studying was Ezekiel. And when I came to that phrase, pass, you're causing your sons and daughters to pass through the fire, I had no idea what he was talking about until I dug a little deeper. And then I realized what it was. In these uh, heightened state of these euphoric highs that they were in because of their drugs, you know. Let me give you an example. Uh, Rachel. You know who Rachel was? Who was Rachel? Jacob's wife. Jacob's wife. And, and she had a sister who married Jacob before she did. And what was her name? Leah. 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 Now, Leah loved Jacob. Rachel loved Rachel. Rachel. <laughs> Rachel was a beautiful woman, but she was very vain. And Rachel loved Rachel. Leah loved Jacob. But Jacob went for the looking instead of the cooking early on, right? <laughs> but Rachel, Rachel decided she would rather get high than be with her husband. You remember the story? And so Leah's son would go out and gather, what was that? Plant, fruit, mandrakes, mandrakes. And, and he would come home, and he, he just seemed to know where they were, and he, you know, it's like mushroom picking. You know, some people just have an art, right? They just know right where to go to get the right mushrooms, you know? And he knew right where to go to get the right mandrakes, and we would come home with a bag full of mandrakes, and Rachel said, I'll tell you what I'll do. You sleep with Jacob tonight, and you give me your son's mandrakes. Now, do you, you know what she was saying? Now, so nothing's new under the sun. She said, I'd rather get high and let you sleep with my husband because they were hallucinogenic. They caused you to have a, this euphoric feeling. Hmm? What's new? Wait a minute. When they came out of Egypt and Moses went up onto the mountain, he and Yahshua, Joshua, for 40 days and 40 nights, and then God gave them the law. What day was that when they gave them the law? It was, it was no, the, when they gave them the law, it was Pentecost or Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. The Feast of Revelation, as the Jews would call it, because they received the law. But when Moses came down from the mountain, what was happening? Operation, Operation Golden Calf. Golden Calf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now Joshua said, it's a noise of war in the camp. Moses, no, it's not war. It's not war. Now, they were in these euphoric highs because they were all drugged up. They just came out of Egypt. Where did they get the drugs? It was their little stash. Yeah. I mean, so what is new under the sun? Nothing. Nothing. What pleasure, physical pleasure, what altered state of consciousness would you be willing to sacrifice your relationship with the Lord for? I mean, that's basically what they've done, haven't they? For a cheap pie or a moment of physical gratification, you sacrifice your relationship with the Lord? How, how, how foolish is that? Verse 31, for you offer your gifts and make your... The gifts are what? The children. They're children. Children are a gift, a reward from the Lord. The Bible tells us that. You offer your gifts, your children, to make your sons pass through the fire. You defile yourselves with your idols. Even to this day, so shall I be inquired of you, O house of Israel. As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired by you. What you have in your mind shall never be when you say, we will be like the Gentiles, like the Goyim. Let 
the families in other countries serving stone, like the families of other countries serving stone and wood and, and gods and idols of their own creation. What are they saying? We want a divorce. We don't want to be married to you anymore, Yahweh. We want to be married to the gods of the pagans, the gods of the Canaanites. No, 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 no. Listen, we want this relationship to end right now, and we want to be like the Goyam. We want to be wed to the Baals and the Astris, the Nemosh and the Molech. You know, and those gods, the invention of those gods were simply the manifestation of the demonic powers that were behind each of those. And the worship of Baal, which goes on today, is the worship of materialism, money, stuff. Baal was a principal provider for all of your wealth, right? Now, he had a consort or a companion named Eshtar. Oh, Eshtar. Does that sound familiar? Eshtar eggs? Eshtar bunnies? Hmm? Easter is not a biblical term. It's not a scriptural term. It's not a Christian term. When they translated, the King James translators translated the Greek text, when they came to Peshka, which is the same as Pesach, Passover, it was too Jewish for them. And their anti-Semitism, they inserted the word Eshtar, Easter. There's no Easter. What an offense that must be to God. Hmm? But these demonic forces that are at work, man, they're manifested by the people who worship them simply by these false gods. They're, Baal is nothing, but the demonic force behind it is something. The worship of sexual immorality and, and the worship of Ashtoreth, Eshtar. Uh, Eshtar is nothing. Oh, but the demonic forces behind the worship of sexual immorality. That's something, those demons, right? And then, and then uh, not only would they have Baal, not only would they have the worship of Ashtar, Ashtoreth, who else? Hmm? Molech. Because of your sexual promiscuity, you would have all of these unwanted children, these gifts that God had given that you say, I don't want it. And so they would sacrifice them because Molech required child sacrifice. Isn't that interesting? How they wanted to go back and be like the gods and, and, and worship the gods of the pagan peoples around them and offering their children as a sacrifice. Worshiping these demons who require your children to be sacrificed and showing your allegiance to the demon rather than worship Jehovah who offered his son for your sake, for your salvation. Amazing. And then as you go down in that, that spiral, that downward spiral, then it's the worship of Nimash, which is the actual worship of Satan, the underworld, the occult. You know. Oh, aren't we glad we're living in this modern age and we've got rid of all of those things? Don't we wish? It's unfortunate, isn't it? We're supposed to be an enlightened people. No. Forever learning, the Bible says. We will be forever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. Hmm. But God says in verse 32, what you have in your mind shall never be. When you say we will be like the Gentiles, like the families of the other countries serving wood and stone, God is saying, no, I'm not going to let that happen. You're not going to get a divorce from me. I've chosen you, and I will redeem you. I will chasten you. I will discipline you to the point to where you will turn back to me. You know, like a, a horse who has a bit in his mouth so he can be turned by his master, right, in the direction he wants it to go. But, you know, when you develop a good relationship with a horse, a horse will follow you wherever you go. Did you know that? Anybody, any horse, men or women here? Yeah. Horses have the, are the same intelligence level as, as a, uh, a highly intelligent dog. And they will, you can have a wonderful relationship with a horse, or you can try to force their behavior. But you try to win the horse through the relationship that they trust you. Same way you train a dog. Same way God is trying to train his people to learn to trust him through his love. But this is grace. Just as he ended chapter 16. Remember chapter 16? He's describing what, what spiritual adultery they've committed, what harlots they were. 
in paying their lovers to lie with them. But in all of that, at the end of chapter 16, what does he say? Yet, yet I will offer you atonement. Forgiveness. Why? Because they deserve it. Why? Because of his great name's sake. And he's going to say that over and over and over again. He's been saying that in chapter 20. All because of, for his great name's sake. You, you can't get away from the amazing, unexplicable, sovereign grace of God. Which of us deserve all the blessing he has given us? If we got what we deserve, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> no. <laughs> so he said, no, you're not going to do that, Israel. Verse 33, as I live, says the Lord God, surely in a, with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. I'll, through the discipline that I'm going to bring about, I am going to train you. I'm going to, discipline means training. The, the problem today is so many parents don't discipline their children any longer. Their children aren't trained by the discipline that should be exercised by the authorities in their life. Well, this is exactly what God is going to do with Israel. Through the discipline that he's going to bring about, he's going to bring them back to him. Verse 34, not only will I rule over you, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you were scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. What's he talking about there? When did that ever happen where they were gathered back together to God because of all of the fury, the trouble, the punishment, the discipline that was exacted upon them? 1945. At the end of 1945, what happened then? Second World War was over. The Jews were liberated from the concentration camps. It was horrific. Horrific. But because of the guilt and the shame that the Western world was feeling, particularly the United States and England, we've allowed the Jews to have a homeland. Once again, we established the homeland for the Jewish people. And God has regathered them back to the land. There are more Jews now in Israel than any other place in the world. It wasn't too long ago there were more Jews in New York City than there were in Israel. But he's brought them back together, hasn't he? I think I mentioned this last week, but you know, during the Roman conquest of Jerusalem, there was such a slaughter of the Jewish people, the Jewry, that one in four Jews were killed. 25% of the Jewish population were killed. It was a discipline. Why did that discipline come about? Because of the rejection of their Messiah. They brought it upon themselves. God didn't want that to happen. So much of the suffering that, that we have gone through in our lives because of the foolish decisions we've made, we brought that upon ourselves. When you read through the book of Jeremiah, God constantly calling his people back to him, but they won't come, and all this suffering has to take place, and, and they have no one to blame but themselves. One in four Jews were killed in 70 A.D. 1945, when it was all over, you look at the population of the Jews in the world, worldwide, how many Jews were killed? One in three. One out of every three Jews was killed during World War II, during the Holocaust. What does Holocaust mean? Burnt offering. It, it was meant to be an offering unto God. The burnt offering was the sacrifice that was offered unto God where the whole sacrifice was consumed upon the altar in worship of God. It wasn't meant to be his people. It's called Holocaust in the Hebrew. The burnt offering is a Holocaust. But the Bible tells us that this continued rejection of their Messiah, of Jesus, by the Jews is going to bring about a horrible consequence where they're going to worship someone who came in his own name. Jesus said, I've come in my father's name and you have rejected me. One is coming in his own name and him you will accept. Who's that? The Antichrist. And during the time of the tribulation, a time of Jacob's trouble or Israel's trouble more than ever before, never been in the past and it will never be again this time of trouble, Jesus said, two out of every three Jews, two out of every three will be killed. And who's to blame for that? They are. They are. 
so much of the suffering that's going on in our world. We, you know, well, we like to blame God, don't we? No, no, no. God, God has the highest and best in mind for us. He said, if you will do these judgments, commandments, these statutes that I give you this day, my testimonies, then you will, you remember what he said last week? You will what? You will live by them. You'll have a wonderful life. If we live life according to the book, it's wonderful, isn't it? Have you not experienced that? I know what it's like for living contrary to the book. Too many years. But now it's been so wonderful living life according to God's word. But here is grace. Hmm. Verse 35, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will plead my case with you face to face, just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will plead my case with you, says the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. What does it mean he makes him pass under the rod? He's the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd of the flock, right? And so God always relates to his people as the shepherd relates to his sheep. And so God is allowing the sheep to pass under his rod because he's examining everyone. Okay, nope. Okay, nope. Nope. Okay, nope. Nope. He's separating the rebellious from the submitted. All God asks of us is that we would humble ourselves and submit to him. Submission becomes a dirty word, doesn't it? Well, especially when you talk about the marriage relationship. Doesn't it? Gals don't like to think about that. Submit. Hmm? But if you have a loving shepherd and you're working together for your common good, right? It's easy. It's easy. The man submits to God and he asks God to lead. And they work together in harmony, complementing one another. The woman submits to her husband because she's submitting to the Lord. Hmm? And what is this bond of the covenant he's referring to here? He gave him the old covenant, right? On the day of Revelation, the Feast of Revelation, on the, on the day of uh, Feast of Weeks or, or Sukkot, he gave them the law. Here's the covenant. Now, you do your part, I'll do my part. What do you think, Jason? You can't do it. What's the problem? I can't, I can't keep the law. The law was given to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can't keep the law. It displays God's moral and ethical purity of which we don't have. It brings us to the place where I need a savior. Thankfully, he offered them the sacrificial system of Leviticus so they would have an atonement, a kofar, a temporary covering for their sin. But all of that was a sign and a symbol, a type of what Jesus would do through his sacrifice. He is the substance, the reality of that sacrifice for us. He's talking about the bond of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. No longer will I write my law on tablets of stone, but now I'm going to write them in your heart. That the Holy Spirit will put them in your heart. It's your desire. Like David would say, your law is my delight. It's not burdensome. It's my joy to do your will, O oh Lord. You see, and that, that makes the difference when you have the Holy Spirit reigning within you. You want to do these things. Hmm. Yes, I will make, verse 37, you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, the new covenant with Jesus. Verse 38, I will purge the rebels from among you, and, and those who transgress against me, I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord God. Oh, boy, you talk about the persecution of the Jews. And talk about the Jewish expulsion from Europe from all of those surrounding countries where when the diaspora occurred, when Israel was destroyed, 70 AD, and the Romans came in, destroyed the temple, slaughtered one out of every four Jews, and they were scattered throughout the nations of the world, then they were at peace, right? They were hunted like a partridge from hill to hill, like a flea on a dog's back, right? Why? Why? What? They broke the covenant. But why were they hunted by the Gentiles? Why? In every country that they entered, were they persecuted and eventually expelled out of the country? Why did it happen to their people, Jeff? Your people. 
You were chosen. <laughs> Could you not choose somebody else for a while? My friend Reptavia says, right? They were trying to maintain their identity and their religion, right? It's amazing that for 2,000 years, they maintained their national identity without a homeland. No people group, if you study anthropology, you study human race, no people group has ever been able to do that. And then to have the ancient language of Hebrew resurrected when they came back into the land. But as they were dispersed throughout all of the countries of the world, they, they couldn't settle in those countries because of the persecution. What, we, what did they call the persecution of the Jews in, in Russia? Program. Programs. Program. The programs. What does that mean, program? That means entire villages of people had to uproot themselves or they converted. Or you had to move out. You know, at the uh, Fiddler on the Roof. You like that? You ever watch Fiddler on the Roof? Anybody ever see the play or watch the movie? What happens at the very end of the, of the movie, the play, the story? There's, Jewish, there's this, this Russian program. They have to leave. They have to move. And they have to leave everything behind. The only thing they get to take with them is what they can carry. That's it. No, no matter whether you spent 30 years or 40 years or 50 years building up your home. and It's all lost. Now, that's been true of the Jews, just as he's saying here. They were scattered to the countries, and they weren't even safe in the countries they were scattered to. They had to leave there. The expulsion of the Jews from England, from Italy, from France, from Spain, from all over Europe. 1492, who sailed the ocean blue? And Columbus was by nationality. He was an Italian by nationality. Why? Everybody likes Italian food, right? Right? But by ethnicity, what was Columbus? Isn't that amazing? Christopher Columbus was a Jew, and he was being sponsored by some very wealthy Jewish merchants in Spain because of the persecution that was occurring, because of the edict that they had to convert to Catholicism, or they were killed, or they had to leave. And he discovers America. And isn't that amazing? that in the last hundred years, at the least, America has been the safest place for the Jews in all the world. Largest concentration of Jews in the modern era have been in America, nowhere else. But now, what has God done? He's regathered them back into the land, just as he prophesied, just as he said he would. Verse 39, as for you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God, go, serve every one of you his idols. And hereafter, if you will not obey me, but profane my holy name, no more with your gifts and your idols. On my holy mountain, on the mountain height of Israel, says the Lord God, there all of the house of Israel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I will accept them, and there I will require their offerings and their first fruits of their sacrifices together with all of your holy things. Wow. Do you know what's being fulfilled here? You know, in order, how many of you are students of Bible prophecy? Eschatology. Okay, there's one book that you really, well, there's two. There's two books in the Old Testament you really need to have a grasp on if you're going to have a correct eschatology. Do you know what those two books are? Daniel? <coughs> Daniel? Zechariah. Zechariah is all about the second coming, all about the restoration of the Jewish people, which is precisely what Ezekiel is prophesying here. But turn with me to Zechariah chapter 12. Go there. You see, this discipline that God is exacting upon them, this, this, this suffering that go, they're going through is a consequence of their own foolishness. He won't let them get a divorce from him. He won't let them leave him. He's going to love them, and he's going to bring them back to himself eventually. You know, Matthew 23, 39, Jesus said, he, he, they'll, not, they'll not see him, they'll not hear his voice again until what? The Jews, until what? They say, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? And he said, you'll not see me again, you'll not hear my voice until that day when you say, all of Israel says, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai, blessed, blessed is he who comes in the name of, they see Jesus for who he really is. Now, Zechariah is the one prophet who gives us such a clear picture of when that event takes place. And that's precisely what Ezekiel is talking about in the latter portion of chapter 20. Go with me to Zechariah chapter 12. Is that where you went? 
Zechariah 12. The burden of the Lord, God against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, who forms the spirit of man within him. Who is he? He's the creator of everything. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. So what's he saying there? The whole world, the whole world one day is going to come again. Do you see how anti-Semitic our nation is becoming? Did, did you, do you understand how anti-Semitic the, the church christened dumb? Not the body of Christ. Not the body of Christ. There's a lot of people who claim to be Christian. They are not. You listen with your eyes. That'll tell you everything. People live what they believe. So if you listen with your eyes, there's no confusion. If you just listen to what people say, well, they make lots of grandiose claims that they never keep. It's never backed up. Their words are never backed up by the power of their deeds or devotion to God, you see. Even the United States is going to break its commitment to Israel. Uh, yesterday, we called the ambassador of Israel into the state office to have a talk with them. What was that about? No, it wasn't about the bombing. They bombed, well, they haven't admitted that, but that's who did it. They bombed uh, Syria again, the airport in uh, Aleppo. But, but why, did, why did our State Department call the ambassador of Israel into... <laughs> No, because of the settlement expansion. They just passed the legislation making it legal to go ahead and make a lot of those settlements that expanded out beyond uh, in the Samaria region in Judea uh, legal. And, and our State Department is up in arms about that. Why? Because we're, what are we trying to force down Israel's throat? The two-state solution. Divide Jerusalem, divide the nation. And, and who's the other state? Is there a Palestinian state? No, no. But, you know, you, you look at some of the news broadcasts that are taking place, and, and you'll, they're talking to some of the Palestinian representatives there, and they're behind a building that says Palestinian State Department of the Palestinian state. Is there a Palestinian state? No. Has there ever been a Palestinian people? No. Where did that word come from, Palestine? From the ancient enemies of Israel, the Philistines. And who called it Palestine, or Palestine. The Romans did after they conquered it over. Why? To mock the Jews. Because the Philistines were the ancient enemies of the Jews. There's, you know, you go back into, again, go back into the history of man, and there's never been a Palestinian people or culture or state, ever. If Jerusalem has ever been an occupied city since David took it over by the Jebusites, remember, it was Jebesh, and David was told to take it over and that God would be, meet him there. And so he did. Whenever Jerusalem was occupied and there was a government established in the city of Jerusalem, it always, always, always was Israel. For almost 3,000 years now. Israel. How many times is Jerusalem mentioned in the Quran? Never. Never. How many times is Jerusalem mentioned in the Bible? Over 600 times. Over 600 times. Amazing. But all the nations of the world will come against Jerusalem. All of them. Verse 3. And it shall happen in that day. When he talks about that day, when any of the prophets say in that day, and in that day, in that, what day is he talking about? The day of the Lord. The consummation of the age. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord's return. And the day of the Lord's a long day because... Psalmist tells us in Psalm 90, a day unto the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years unto the day. We know that uh, with the rapture of the church will begin the tribulation period. The end of the tribulation will establish the messianic millennial kingdom of Christ, which reigns for a thousand years. So that's the day we're talking about. In that day, when all of this begins to transpire. Yes, it'll happen in that day. Well, I'm in Jerusalem, a heavy stone of all peoples who would heave it away, will surely be cut in pieces, although all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. And that's what's going to happen. Netanyahu is not a popular man in the world. The Jewish people are not popular. The world would gladly sacrifice Jewish blood for Arab oil. 
glad, and we've done that for decades now, allowing the terrorist activity that's taking place. You know, upset with Jewish settlers because they're building homes, planting vineyards, orchards, establishing a wonderful life. But on the other side, what are they doing? Murdering people. Now, if, if the Israelis today surrendered all their weapons and sought peace, what would happen? They'd be murdered. If the Palestinians surrendered all their weapons and said, we want peace, what would happen? Peace. They'd have peace. Do you understand that? Hmm. Most of the world doesn't. Verse 4, in that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah. I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. The governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. Verse 6, in that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a, in a fire pan in a wood pile. They'll be protected and preserved by God. And like a fiery torch in the sheaves, they shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. Jerusalem, God is going to protect the city. He's going to establish it. Let's go down to, uh, and then he talks about the, how, how the weakest among them will be like David and the strongest among them will be like God himself. Right? Verse 9, it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. It's going to be a bad, bad time for those who have sought Israel's destruction. There is no doubt in anybody's mind that if Iran develops a nuclear weapon and the capability to launch it, what are they going to do? Annihilate, Annihilate Israel. In their, in their eschatology, in their belief, in Islam, they believe that the Mahdi, their Messiah, will come when they cause great confusion and destruction throughout the globe, throughout the world. He's going to dominate the world through that upheaval. But principally, they're going to eradicate the Jews from the face of the earth. Drive them into the Mediterranean, where they're no more. How long has that been going on, where they want to try to eradicate your people, Jeff? Years. Years. <laughs> Since the seed of the woman. Right? Since Pharaoh in Egypt. It's amazing. Most persecuted people on the planet, the Jews. Hmm. Chapter 12, verse 10, in particular to what Ezekiel is declaring about this birth of Israel spiritually, where they will recognize Jesus as their Messiah. For I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look upon me whom they have pierced. And yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for his firstborn. It'll be such a day of repentance and regret, shame, guilt for what they have done in murdering their own Messiah. We're studying Acts chapter 2, where on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all of those Jewish men, devout Jewish men from all over the known world at that time, and then Peter begins to give this wonderful sermon on the grace, the gospel, the good news, that our sins could be forgiven and we can have a place in heaven by simply acknowledging that Jesus Christ died for our sins the Savior of the world. And if we'll surrender and submit to him, we have a place, Peter says, not only do you have a place reserved for you in heaven, but now the Holy Spirit, God himself, is keeping you for that place. Just like God is keeping Israel, not every Jew, but he's keeping Israel, only one nation on the face of the earth has a favored nation status in God's eyes, and that's Israel. And they cannot divorce him. He won't allow it. He's going to fulfill and complete all of his promises and all of his plans for Israel. But here, they will look upon him whom they have mourned as one who grieves for his firstborn. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning at Hadad Rimen in the plain of Megiddo. Who are they mourning then? The great king Josiah. Josiah was a wonderful king. There, were, there weren't many. All of the kings in the northern kingdom were all evil, wicked. But in the southern kingdom of Judah, there were eight good kings. Four of them were reformers. They brought about great reforms in Israel. And one of the greatest was Josiah. And when Josiah died, there was great mourning in all of Israel when he died. That's what he's talking about here. And the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself. 
and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives, the family of Levi itself, etc. It said all the families of the earth will mourn because of him. If you go on and continue reading and you move into chapter 14, you'll see that God's keeping his promise. Zechariah gives us such insight in the plan of God with regard to the Messiah of Israel. If you really want to understand Bible eschatology, you have to know the book of Zechariah, and you'll have no problem understanding God has a very specific and unique plan for the nation of Israel. The plan and the purposes of God for Israel are earthly. The plan and the purposes of God for the church, both Jew and Gentile, are heavenly, spiritual. Okay? But God will fulfill his plan. Now, it's unfortunate that much of Christendom has embraced a false doctrine, which is called replacement theology, where they believe that the church has replaced Israel. No such thing. They have no understanding of the book of Zechariah and what God has promised. So go back to Ezekiel. We'll wrap it up. At least this portion. We'll go to verse 44. Verse 41, I will accept you as a sweet aroma, the sacrifice that they make now, because they're in repentance and they're in sorrow and grief. I will accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you were scattered, and I will be hallowed in, your, in you before the Gentiles. Um, and you know what's going to happen there as we move further on into Ezekiel. He prophesies of this conflict that's going to take place, the Gog-Magog war. Magog is what nation? Gog is the leader of Magog. The Magagites are the ancient Scythians. The ancient Scythians are the present-day Russians. So make no mistake about that. You know, Ezekiel had to explain this based upon the people groups that were existing in his day. So when he talks about the Magagites, the Magagites were those who occupied Rush, uh, Meshach, and Tibal, ancient cities of the present-day nation of... You know how, how many time zones Russia covers? We cover four, right? You know how many time zones Russia covers? Eleven. We cover five, four time zones. They cover eleven. Huge. But anyway, what, what Ezekiel is going to prophesy later on as we get into chapters 38 and 39 is that this enemy comes down from the extreme north to attack Jerusalem. It'll be Gog, the leader of Magog, the Magagites. And who's with him? The Persians. Who are the Persians? Iranians. There's never been a military alliance between the Russians and the Iranians in all of world history until this current time. They seem to have a common enemy. And not only would it be the Russians and the Persians or the Iranians, because Iran was called Persia until 1938, I think it was, and they changed their name to Iran. But if you talk to an Iranian, they don't say they're an Iranian. They say they're Persians. Right? And then the other is the House of Togarma. Who's that? Turkey, Turkey, isn't that interesting? How all of the, you know, it's amazing how God's word is so true. 2,500 years ago, this desert prophet could see into our day and time. It's amazing to me. Why? Because it's extraterrestrial. Why? It's outside of our time space continuum. It's, it's God revealing that he is God. He said one of the ways in which he proves he's God is he tells you the end of a matter at the beginning. Only the Bible, 30% of the Bible is prophetic. Only the Bible does that. No other religious writing attempts to do that. And some of those prophecies are so specific. Naming King Cyrus, where Daniel comes and offers him the scroll of Isaiah and says, oh, by the way, your name's in here. 150 years before he's even born. God names him by name. Cyrus, the king, will release the Jews from their captivity and allow them to go back into the land and rebuild the city. 150 years before the man's born. Isaiah writes this. If you take eight major prophecies concerning the birth of Jesus Christ, eight, and you do the, the mathematical probability of those eight major prophecies coming true in the life of any one man, you know, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's like one in ten to the twenty-eighth power. That, that, now there are over three hundred. I'm not talking eight. There are over three hundred very specific prophecies that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled right to the very day. It's amazing. We'll talk about one of those on Palm Sunday. Where was I? 42. 
Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the country which I raise my hand in an oath to give to your fathers. Which, which he's done, 1948, May 14th, 1948, Israel, a nation among the nations after almost 2,000 years. Amazing. Verse 43, and there you shall remember your ways and all your doings with which you were defiled, and you shall loathe yourself in your own sight because of all the evils that you have committed. In order to really come to the Lord, there has to be a period of repentance where you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not just sorry for what you did. You're not sorry you got caught. You're sorry for who you are. To this day, I've been saved. I've been, I've been walking with the Lord for 43 years now. But to this day, I still have terrible sorrow and regret and shame and guilt over who I was and what I was. And, and what I'm capable of if I walk away from the Lord for just a moment. If I, I, can't, I can't lose my salvation. Please don't misregard and don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Salvation is a gift from God. And once you receive that gift, it's yours now and forever. You didn't do anything to get yourself saved. You can't do anything to keep yourself saved. That's a work of God. You're not getting a divorce. <laughs> just like Israel's not getting a divorce. You're not getting a divorce. Once you're his, you're his now and and, I, and it's not based upon the law, it's based upon a love relationship, right? I use my son as the analogy. I have a son. I love my son. I love him dearly. Have I always been happy with what he's done? No, of course not. You've got to train him up, right? But I've never not loved him, and he's never not be my, been my son. I'll never not. I'll never not love him. And I'll never disown him and say he's not my son. Right? Well, that's, that's the relationship we have today. Now, now, you can act like that old man or old woman all over again. You, can, you start one, listen, you're one bad choice away from going down this spiral where people would have to wonder, are you really saved? Good example of that is King David. You know, when he, when he got so distressed, so depressed, so discouraged that he left the land of Israel and joined himself to the Philistines. And during that period, if you looked at him at Ziglag, you would say, there's no way this man could be saved. There's no way. How could God say he's got a whole heart for God? Hmm. No. But God tells them here that they're going to have such deep guilt and shame. And that's and listen, and, and when you come to the Lord and you see yourself for who you really are, that, that's the first thing that happens. You're so filled with guilt and so filled with shame. And then there's this repentance where you say, God, please forgive me. Help me. Change me, Lord. Remake me, Lord. I'm born a sinner. I'm born of Adam with the sin gene, right? Let's, let's talk about it that way. I got a sin gene. Anybody predisposed to high blood pressure, sugar, diabetes, heart? Can you do anything about your genetic makeup? It's in your genes, right? A lot of it's in the genes. A lot of diseases that we carry today, it's in the genes. Can you do anything about your genetic makeup? Now, if you were born into my family, you'd be a happy man. I'm going to be here a lot longer than I want to be if the Lord doesn't return because, you know, they, they, these Variellis, they live too long. You know, when I buried my father's sister at 106, you know, you know, just good genes. Eat all the wrong stuff. Still have good blood pressure. Good cholesterol, you know. So people who are predisposed to certain physical ailments would wish they could change their gene pool, wouldn't they? Of course they would. But you can't do that, can you? No. But we're born with a sin gene. We're born sinners by nature. And God says, yeah, we can do something about that. You can become born again. You could get a new nature. Christ's nature. You're born of Adam. Now you can be born of Christ. And now he begins to change you from the inside out. And you have all control over that sin gene. It's not there anymore. Now you have the Holy Spirit. Now, now within your heart, he has written his law where you desire to do what is good, what is right. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, this period of repentance and mourning, guilt and shame. Verse 44, then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have dealt with you for my name's sake. 
Not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O house of Israel, says the Lord God. You know, aren't you glad he hasn't dealt with you according to your evil ways and your desires? Hmm? Your selfishness, your greed, your love of self. You know, we have to admit it before Christ comes into our life, the person we love more than anybody else in the world. Who do you trust more than anybody else in the world making your decisions? Me. I love me. Right? But when you come to the Lord, you get a divorce from yourself and you're wed to the Lord. Hmm? Marriage. Marriage is only going to work if you really decide to get a divorce from yourself and be wed to someone else and live for their highest and best. Then it works. Hmm? Isn't that wonderful, the grace of God? Israel, all, read Romans 9, 10, and 11. All Israel will be saved, Paul said. Why? Because it's God's doing. Not because of their wicked deeds, not because of anything they've done, but because of his great name. And why are you being kept? Why were you chosen? Why are you serving the Lord? Why are you living a life that would please the Lord and demonstrate to the rest of the world what God expects of us? Because of his great name. You carry his name now. Not our own anymore. No. When I go to heaven, it's not Variali anymore. It's I am. <laughs> right? That's all I have. David, you got a closing song? Shall we stand?